front of this computer. Excellent. All right. I'm going to go through and mute everybody now. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end, so you can unmute yourselves then, but I'm going to mute you for now. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us virtually on this beautiful Friday. Um, I'm really happy uh, uh, that you're here because I know you're in for a treat. Um, 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 as we hear from our artist in residence, Emily Hussart. Um, Emily is the first uh, uh, MFA artist in residence at the Dorsky to have an exhibition on site. And we are so thrilled with the incredible show she curated from our collection and the interactive project, which is part of it. Um, I do want to invite everybody, if possible, if you feel comfortable, to come see the show in person. It's, uh, the museum is open Wednesdays through Sundays, uh, 11 a.m. through 5 p.m. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce. I'm Zach Bowman at the Dorsky Museum, um, the manager of education and visitor experience. In case you're wondering why I'm the one talking right now. Uh, um, I also would uh, uh, encourage you to um, um, uh, check out Emily's performance, which is taking place as part of the Upstate Arts Weekend, the last weekend of August. Um, it's an offsite event, and she'll be able to provide some more information for you about that. Um, I also want to just do a quick plug that we are hosting our first in-person gathering in over a year here at the Dorsky. Uh, it's outside on Sunday, June 6th at 2 p.m. I know, yes, it's like amazing. Um, it's a celebration of Kathy Goodell's exhibition. There'll be music, uh, cash bar. Um, there will be more information up on the website soon. I look really looking forward to seeing uh, people masked up, but in person at the museum. Um, if you have questions throughout Emily's presentation, uh, just put them in the chat window. I'll monitor it um, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for her. Uh, but then we'll have time uh, at the end to, uh, to take questions. Uh, we can, you know, it can be a casual conversation. Um, Emily, take it away. Hi, um, I was just wondering also if if this is being streamed on Facebook Live, are you good? Are you able to monitor any yep. questions coming through there? I'll too? be doing that through my through my uh, desktop computer. Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, um, hi. <laughs> I'm Emily Hussart. Um, I'm an MFA student at SUNY New Pulse. I've just I'm in the middle or getting the, towards the end of completing this artist in residency at the Dorsky Museum, um, which has been really an incredible experience and a big learning experience for me. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the show that I curated and the interactive portion of that show. And then um, it would be great. We could have a little discussion at the end if everyone, if anyone has any questions. Um, so please feel free to stop me at any point. And Zach, do wave at me if I start mumbling. <laughs> please, that would be great. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone at the Dorsky, first of all. Um, the amazing director and curator Anna Conlon, who's really helped me a lot with this. Um, Zach has <laughs> been so supportive and given me amazing feedback all the way through and everyone else who works there and has been helpful in, in multiple ways during this whole time. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with the Dorsky. Um, and yeah, I'm really grateful for the experience. Um, so, I'm going to share my screen now and show a few slides about the show. Um, some of you may have visited it in person and some of you may not have had the chance. Um, so I'm going to just share a little bit what's actually in the show, just briefly, so that we can all kind of be on the same page in terms of what that experience is like. Um, here we go. <laughs> okay. Is that working, Zach? Great, okay. Um, so <clears throat> the show is called Dirt Inside Landscapes. And so a lot of people have been asking me why, um, <laughs> why did why come up with this idea for a show 
um, <clears throat> you know, tra traditionally artist residencies are used, well, not used necessarily, but um, quite often with artist residencies, it's an opportunity to show your work in the museum context. And um, one of the opportunities with this was to make a piece during the residency and show it. Um, but what I really wanted to do was kind of examine what the institution is for and use that as a starting point. Um, and so another thing that had struck me years ago when I moved to the States, you can probably tell by my accent, I grew up in England and moving here and hearing people use the word dirt for the earth was really shocking. Um, that's a very negative word where I'm from. And so I never quite managed to forget that. And um, that was kind of the, the germinating idea for this show. And I was thinking about the museum, which is not, I, I mean, the Dorsky does some wonderful programming and um, but it's not the, always the most welcoming space to be in. Architecturally, it's very difficult. I think it's very heavy. It feels a bit like a fortress. Um, it's very geometric and hard. And it's quite easy to put the viewer or the visitor into an attitude of just kind of like being rather small and, and just accepting what's on the walls, you know, going there to enrich yourself and then leaving. And I kind of wanted to really fight against that with this show. Um, so, uh, I decided to make uh, a space inside the museum, which didn't really feel quite like a museum show, which challenged the idea of a museum show and took works from the Dorsky's collection um, and invited people to look at them in quite a different way. So I, half the room is um, filled with works from the Dorsky's collection that are landscapes and of course, seeing landscapes in a museum in the Hudson Valley is very expected activity. <laughs> We, we know what to do with that, um, usually, but it does involve some awe and some kind of admiration and not much real giving, I think, on the part of the viewer. And I, you know, my work for the last few years has been focused on um, the ways in which humans in contemporary America have been, are dissociated from the earth, from our own ecologies that we need to survive, that, that we depend on for all, all our food that live inside us. Um, one, of the, one of the facts and figures that have really, that has really struck with, uh, stuck with people, I think, is that um, you have more microorganisms inside your body than you have human cells. So to imagine that there's this separation between us and the natural world, <laughs> so-called natural world, is actually entirely fictional. Um, and so I kind of wanted to really sort of um, dig in there and address, address this dissociation, think about where that comes from and what can we do about it? Because it's causing a lot of destruction. It's uh, resulting in a lot of unsustainable behaviors, a lot of injustice, and it's not, um, it's not really okay. <laughs> um, so I wanted to take the institution of the museum and the landscape which is, you know, the Hudson Valley is famous for its landscapes and the community nearby, which this museum is supposed to be serving and kind of really dissolve the barriers between those three things. Um, create a space where the community could come in and think about landscapes in quite maybe radically new, but quite simple ways in this situation and actually be a part of the show too um, and kind of confuse things a bit. <clears throat> of course, the show happened during COVID and so some of my plans had to be altered considerably. Uh, had had an early plan to put a little Dorsky kiosk in the supermarket and um, ask people to draw industrially farmed vegetables with me <laughs> while we talked about the so-called wild and the health of the wild and you know their experiences with dirt. And that wasn't possible during this time, but it was possible to ask people to come in or to mail in things or to interact virtually in, in various ways and to think about their own personal experiences with dirt. And the word dirt, you can see on your screen right now, this is from the Oxford English Dictionary, um, has rather negative roots. <laughs> it comes from the Old Dutch, Old Norse word for excrement, which has then, then appeared in Old Dutch and, there, and after that in English. Um, it's unclean matter that soils, filth, foulness, uncleanness, useless material. So it's not a complimentary word. It's, it, and, once you start to think that the earth, once you realize this is the fact, you know, this is a scientific discovery of, of old. And these days, very commonplace thing to know is that 
you know, a teaspoon of soil contains over a billion microorganisms if it's healthy. Um, Earth is living matter. And so, you know, for, for me, appearing at this moment in the Hudson Valley and having this opportunity in the Dorsk Museum in New Pulse and thinking about my own background, which, you know, I'm, I'm Dutch, I'm of, I've got Huguenot blood and I, I grew up in England. So those people, the Dutch and the Huguenots and the, the English are the people that came over and took over this land, you know, invaded and, and destroyed a culture which had been for multiple thousands of years, um, a way, you know, modeled a way of, of living collaboratively with the land. I'm talking about the Lenape people specifically in this area um, who, had, who had worked with the land, lived with it, had quite different attitude to the land. And the colonizers, you know, my, my predecessors um, came over and brought with them attitudes of domination, of uh, ideas of ownership and borders, which really didn't exist previously and caused a lot of damage. Um, so it seemed like an amazing coincidence that you know, my background to be here at this moment seemed like something to really um, dive into and mess around with. Um, the other thing I thought was kind of interesting was that uh, in a museum, you know, if you're looking at landscapes in a museum, you have a very specific idea of what that means. We go there to admire, to be inspired, to, you know, <laughs> all these things, to look at things in gold frames and, you know, that feel like those, the talent and the, you know, the awe and wonder is just going to flood over us and then somehow improve us or something or nourish us. Um, but in fact, you're standing on a landscape when you're standing in the museum. And it's quite an odd activity in a funny sort of way to be standing in a sealed box with filtered air and no windows to be looking at a picture of a landscape that somebody else did in a rectangle on the wall <laughs> with this land right underneath you at that moment with a whole long history. And in this case, a long history of sustainable living and quite a short history of rather destructive domination. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to get people to, to disrupt that <laughs> process of just admiring and, and looking and, and curate um, a selection of landscapes from the museum that show different artists' relationships with the land over time. And it's chronological and it goes from Thomas Cole, who was really known as the founder of the Hudson River School, um, which is also the beginning of museum culture, right through to the present moment. So um, while I was looking at all this, I was looking online at advertising the way that cleaning products have been advertised in, the, in, in history in America. And I found this amazing <laughs> tin of old Dutch cleanser chasing the dirt and you know <laughs> I was thinking about when how dirt has been used in the word dirt has been using positive and negative ways and so this has kind of become the symbol for a show for the show <laughs> um, here's an installation view of, of the seminar room which is the room that dirt inside landscape is in inside the museum it's quite a small room on one side you can see this um, curated selection of, of works um, Thomas Cole's sketchbook is in the cabinet on the right and then it goes uh, chronologically <clears throat> around to the left. I'm gonna talk through those works just a little bit now. Um, this is Thomas Cole's sketchbook, which was an absolute thrill to find in the collection because on the first page, there's a poem by Cole. And I've put just a few verses, um, I've <laughs> abbreviated a bit, but it's really about his relationship with the landscape. Uh, you know, that the Hudson River painters had a quite a specific Christian based relationship with the land and the landscapes they chose to paint were, you know, vast vistas from high viewpoints that, that were awe-inspiring and, and designed to make people feel, feel small in relation to nature. And that the poem kind of really fits in with this, you know, he's thinking about the temporality of his work in relation to the rocks <clears throat> and the, the sky and the mountains high. Um, but there are lots of things that, are left out of this picture also, which is something we'll come to later with Jean-Marc Superville-Sovac's work, uh, which references the Hudson River School landscapes. Um, and I also have a George Innes in the, in the show. Innes is a contemporary of Cole's, but has quite a different, also Christian-based relationship with the land, but kind of radically different, really. He's not known as one of the Hudson River School because 
he's not looking for that kind of awe where the human is looking from the top and it does kind of have an air of domination about it, even as you know, you're feeling small. There's a very close connection between humans and God in the, in the Cole Hudson River School paintings. And here in Innes, what we see in fact, you know, Innes, is, um, Innes was heavily influenced by a mystic called Swedenborg, who, um, you know, this is one of Innes's later works. And in this painting, we see Innes's belief that if you were, could be really open, you could actually see the spirituality inside the landscape, which acted almost like a veil for this kind of pulsing inner life, which was the spirituality. So it's more removed from, from the a classic conception of Christianity. And you can see his brushwork gets very, very loose. And it's something inside that he's painting is much more impressionistic. Um, so that's a really curious, contemporary, different way of seeing the landscape, but still is something that we would reg as, register as a traditional landscape painting with a skyline and a viewpoint. Um, Stefan Hirsch is more, more usually associated with New York City, but it was really interesting to find this drawing of his um, taking his um, modern precisionist style, which, which is really celebrating urban scapes and using a lot of geometry and seeing those forms appear in his landscape drawing clouds, waves and rocks um, from 1941. That was sort of a fascinating thing to start to see urban forms, you know, the celebration of urban forms appearing in a landscape work like this. Um, this work by John Fall, he's a wonderful photographer who unfortunately passed away of COVID last year. Um, it's, a, it's an amusing work. A lot of his work is quite humorous. Um, it's a photograph of, in the style of a monumental landscape photograph or a postcard or something like that with a very high um, skyline and with this hugely sort of heavy dominating form in it, which represents, you know, which, which reminds us of mountains or rock scapes. But in fact, it's a pile of salt weighed down with tires and um, he's created a false mirage made of bagels. I'm doing this loud, sorry, I'm going by. <laughs> so really he's questioning the truth in landscapes. Um, especially in photography, you know, what, what is, what do we perceive in a photograph and, and are we allowed to trust that as for what's real and also what kind of monuments and landmarks do we make in the landscape? And so I think this is kind of a, a really fun photograph <clears throat> to, to look at in this context. This work by N.J. Jaffe um, is a photograph which has kind of two different functions. Um, Jaffe has created a, a kind of beautiful abstract composition out of a rock formation. But at the same time, his prints are so rich, they really aimed to give you this sort of visceral experience of what it would be like to actually be in that spot and be experiencing the rock in a black and white 2D format. So that's quite unique. All these artists are local in some ways. Very, the whole show is kind of really about this specific area of the world. Um, this photograph by Sharon Kaur from 2005, it's not typical of her work. She's um, an incredible photographer who often does Dutch still life um, flower arrangements where she's regrown those specific types of tulips and other things, um, which is partly interesting because they're impossible. They're, often those things weren't in bloom at the same time, but then creating photographs which are so rich in detail and, and mimic these paintings so carefully that we're really unclear what they are exactly. He puts this in this very ambiguous space. Um, Sharon Kaur's photograph here shows us a fast food truck moving through the Kingston landscape. So she's really juxtaposing billion year old rock formations with this close up of a greasy burger, <laughs> fast food, junk food, oops. Um, and uh, <clears throat> with the kind of famous hills of the Hudson Valley in the background, um, making us think perhaps, you know, what is our contribution to the landscape? Like what's in our contemporary moment, what is it that we're, <laughs> we're doing to the space? How do we contribute? How does the production of this kind of food harm the landscape? Which is an ex extremely relevant question that has long and rich answer. Um, and, I was, I got distracted. <laughs> this is Peter Yanarelli's work here. Um, it was totally a thrill to find this work in the collection. 
this piece is called This Land is My Land and This Land is Your Land, um, based on the Woody Guthrie song, folk song. Um, this piece is so exciting because it's incredibly simple. It's, it's some dirt from Beacon that Peter Yan really found <clears throat> in his neighborhood. And it's raised off the ground on these plexiglass boxes and it's separated into two geometric parts by a gap, by technically by nothing. And it raises all kinds of questions about ownership. It makes absurd, I think, the concept of ownership and drawing square borders around land. Um, it's putting dirt in the museum, which is super exciting. It's something I wanted to do all along before I found this work um, in about the cleanest place you could think of. <laughs> and it also performs another function, which I wasn't expecting, which is that when people walk through the museum and they see this piece in the middle of the room, they come right in and they want to touch it. They want to be around it. It, it breaks that boundary for them immediately and has and, and opens up the space for people to come in and say, oh, okay, I, this is familiar to me. It's not intimidating. I want to be here. And it's full of finger marks. And I don't know how Peter feels about that, but I suspect he's probably quite pleased. I don't know, I'm pleased. Um, but I like that ambiguity too, that you come in and it's like, well, oh, but it's in a museum. So can I touch it? Is it okay? Is it elevated to, it's still dirt, but now it's in here. So now what, you know, I think that's a really interesting uh, place to be stuck. <laughs> and it's definitely started a lot of conversations for me in that space. Um, here is a print by Jean-Marc Subtil Sobek. It's a, this is a collaborative print in a way. He, uh, he had done a whole series of works that were recently collected by the Dorsky. They're engravings of Hudson River School paintings, um, which was a way to disseminate these extremely expensive works that were only able to be collected by the wealthiest patrons who were probably making a lot of their money from enslaved labor um, and you know, invisible <laughs> forces that are not ever visible in these paintings. Um, and so having a gold framed Hudson River landscape in your house is really kind of a status thing as well as an enjoyment of the picturesque view. Um, and these images were disseminated through engravings, which were sometimes colored like this one and sometimes not. Jean-Marc is taking these engravings and inserting into them prints of people who would always have been excluded from these images. Um, like here we see an enslaved person coming out of the riverbank, escaping or running somewhere, he certainly <laughs> is uh, not in a comfortable position, but it, it makes us wonder, for maybe for the first time, um, what, who decides what the picturesque is? Who decides who gets included? You know, the, the happy sailors and there are other etching, uh, other engravings in this series where we see, you know, wealthy people lounging on the banks of the river enjoying the view. But we certainly don't see the laborers who paid for it or who would have paid for the patrons of the paintings or who would have been working in the background under horrific conditions. So those ugly suppressed realities are very simply and powerfully brought to the forefront by these works. And it was super exciting to have that in the show. Um, it also kind of flanks the wall with the Georgian, it's in the heavy gold frame. Jean-Marc has very amusingly put like <laughs> a gold sort of tacky frame and about 15 mounts in the <laughs> engraving to make this extraordinary object. <clears throat> um, and so on the other side of the room is the interactive wall, which, um, which is still growing. And I feel like this whole project is really just growing. This has been a real experiment for me. Um, so on the other wall, I wanted people to be able to share their experiences of the, of the word dirt and their thoughts and memories around that theme, um, their experiences and their immediate associations. And so I made a kind of landscape skyline, which and this is a very famous skyline that you see when you leave the Dorsky. It's kind of very iconic with the Mohawk sky tower on the horizon line. Um, <clears throat> I tried to make this skyline with a series of questions to just prompt people to start thinking about what their relationship is with the land. Because ultimately, I think the goal of my residency is to have people think about that. And of course, you know, I think if people, if people see a whole range of different artists' relationships with the land, and they're prompted to think about their relationship with the land, hopefully they realize that, you know, that their future relationship <clears throat> with this land is, is their choice. And of course that choice is completely up to them. Um, but I suppose my goal was to ask that question. And so that when people leave, 
they would never be able to say again that they had never thought about that relationship. Um, and I think that's, as an artist, that's about all you can do. <laughs> sort of just ring a bell and say, okay, you know, here's, here's, a, here's an open door to start this conversation with your friends and neighbors and with, and he, you know, to, there's, a, there's a lot of dialogue about this at the moment. Um, so there's plenty to read and uh, discuss. So some of the questions on the wall were things like, um, do you like mud? <laughs> what does mutual healing look like? Um, is domination a sign of strength? Um, can we relearn to respect something that we do not understand? Because I think that's one of the big problems in terms of this kind of Eurocentric attitude to the land is that if we don't understand it, we just ignore it. <laughs> we just kind of like ride roughshod over it. And I, for me, those forms are really embedded in the kind of architecture I see in the door scheme or the kind of architecture we all live in. Like right now I'm in this geometric room. It doesn't at all suit human beings really or living beings, um, but does represent this kind of unilateral way of thinking that has characterized post-colonial attitudes in America and in Europe. Um, so for this wall, I wanted to get away from a lot of the museum features. I wanted to write on the wall with charcoal, which is a natural material. Uh, I wanted to have lots of organic shapes and handwriting and no frames <laughs> and have it be pretty much an organic community wall that would grow over the course of the show that could just become whatever it became, kind of a contemporary brainstorming, uh, sort of organism. And so that amazingly has been growing really beautifully over the course of the show. And actually it's gonna be about double this size quite soon. I've just got a whole load of new entries, which are fascinating. On the left, we can see the view of the Mohawk skyline that I'm talking about when you leave the door ski alongside some extremely hard, heavy architecture, <laughs> just kind of a perfect um, <clears throat> counterpoint to that beautiful line that we see of the hills. And on the right, that's my son contributing his thoughts on dirt to the wall, but it's, um, it's growing all the time. It's been super exciting to see what people have put. People have been incredibly generous with their thoughts and memories and the range of answers has really spanned <laughs> quite widely. Um, and I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, on the left, a dirt, a speck, a peck, a pinch of earth, eat some every day, play in it if you may. Healthy are those who do it this way, by Ginny Davis, 80 years old. Wore many hats so far, more to learn and do till on this earth of dirt I'm through. <laughs> I love that. Um, on the right, dirt under the fingernails, the worst. Um, the detritus of life is ground to dirt, which lays the foundation for new life. And they put this comment at the bottom, the best dirt has the smell of death. I love that. Um, and this person on the right here tried to write a poem, didn't feel like they could write a poem, but they did think about the word dirt and the letters in the word dirt. I made a comparison right at the end between touching dirt, which seems very uncomfortable, and flower, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I actually have a couple of extra ones with me that just came in. I wanted to read out a beautiful drawing by somebody with all the creatures, if you can see this, all the creatures underground. Um, this is a short note somebody wrote. I am dirt, soil, earth. It is just a matter of time until I return in communion. Meanwhile, I garden to stay sane. <laughs> Um, this one is all about hating dirt. When I was a kid, my sister and I would fight outside and she'd stick my face in the dirt. I hate looking or feeling dirty and I never want someone else to think that I am. Um, someone said, I have some dirt under my fingernails right now. We love planting trees as kids and the contact with the soil is still fresh in my mind some 70 years later. Our kids don't have that sentiment. And I regret not getting them to feel the soil at an early age. There's a poem about loving dirt. <laughs> I love dirt. This is the last one. Dirt loves me. It's everything around me, but without it, I wouldn't break free from the clean, perfect human they want me to be. So it's been really amazing to see people's drawings and, and thoughts and associations. And, and they, 
and some of them are really negative. Um, I've been doing some workshops in schools too, which has been absolutely brilliant. One of the problems with the museum is that most of the people who experience the exhibits are people who go to museums. <laughs> and so in a funny sort of way, COVID has given me the opportunity to quite easily break through that and do virtual workshops with schools and have their work appear in the museum. And I did another workshop recently, which is right here uh, with a group of students from SUNY New Paltz. It was called Dirt Dinner Party. And it was also a virtual workshop, but we got to do something very physical together. Um, I invited them to come on a journey with me <laughs> and forage around our homes, our, our internal env environments for things that might make a feast for the earth as a kind of thank you gift, treating the earth like an honored guest. And so we went around and we found things like um, food that we were gonna have for dinner that we wanted to feed to the earth, food scraps and waste that makes great food for the earth, um, but also things like fingernail clippings and human hair and pet hair and floor sweepings with toast crumbs in it and all these things that, and dead flowers that people have been enjoying and all kinds of things that maybe people had never thought of as, as food for the earth. And then we came back and compared notes and assembled it into a beautiful meal for an honored guest. And it, it, happened, it happened to be pouring with rain that day, <laughs> which was really great. Because then we all went outside and we, we mixed the earth that we had dug up with our spoons with a little bit of water and our ingredients and our gifts. And then we return it to the exact same spot where it had come from. And that, the reason for that was partly that, you know, when you read about what soil scientists have to say about this, uh, this word dirt, Soil also has negative connotations, but dirt for a soil scientist is soil that has been removed from its, um, from its home, from, its, from these incredibly delicate, sophisticated ecological connections that it makes over many, 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 many years. And so when you take it out of that context, it's no longer to able to perform the same function that it performs in that spot because of those slow building relationships that we simply just are not aware of, we ignore them. We, they don't seem important to us because we can't see them. But I think, you know, that's, that's precisely my goal with this residency is to, <laughs> to make people aware that this is a living organism that needs to be respected. There are huge justice issues around this. Um, environmental racism is a term for the earth being poisoned or the water being poisoned quite deliberately by, by wealthy people who want to dispose of top toxic wastes, not near their homes, but near marginalized communities, often low-income communities of color. And so a lot of people are quite, quite rationally afraid of the dirt near them because it's not safe. And that is quite clearly not fair and needs to be, <laughs> needs to be public knowledge, first of all, and then that just simply can't happen anymore. Um, so raising awareness of these things while doing something physical and joyful and, and also thinking about ownership of things that are living, I think, you know, it's very clear to us now that you cannot own a person. I think um, it's a big question whether you can own anything living. Um, for me, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that that is, is um, I, I think that's simply just completely misguided to have that attitude. I don't think I own my pets. <laughs> I think we, maybe we are stewards of things and um, we can live collaboratively and both do what we can for each other. Um, so in terms of thinking about what progress looks like for the future, I think going back to an idea of living things cooperating is a really beautiful thing that comes from many, many ancient cultures, including Native American cultures from right here. Um, it's not something I'm an expert on, but there are lots of people doing really interesting work in this field. And um, if you're interested, get in touch and I'll send you lots of, <laughs> lots of links. So that's the end of my talk for the moment. Uh, there's an Instagram page for this project. It's at dirt.scapes if you're interested. Um, also on a very related note, there's a show opening at Unison Arts Center on June the 26th that I'm a part of called Owning Earth, which is lots of artists, I think 19 artists radically, radically rethinking the way that um, we have relationships with the land. And as Zach mentioned at the beginning, Upstate Art Weekend uh, is August the 27th to 29th. Um, and I'll be doing an interactive piece at the Nyquist Harcourt Wildlife Sanctuary in New Paltz, which I'd love you all to come and join in with. Thank you very much. Curious to see if you have any questions. Awesome. 
if um, <clears throat> if anybody has questions, you can you're you're uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. I believe I allowed that. Yep. Um, I don't see anything in the chat. I do see Sharon is here. Oh. Hi, Sharon. Oh my goodness. Sharon, <laughs> artist. <laughs> How exciting. Hi, Sharon. Nice to meet you. <laughs> You're muted, Sharon. I can't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was saying that I literally came in from digging in the dirt. Yes. And I saw <laughs> the Instagram tag tagged with my name and I was like I've got to find out what this is about oh my goodness um, I'm happy you're here. thank you for including my work um and I really enjoyed your talk um the yeah the 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 soil the earth the dirt is very near and dear to me so it was wonderful to uh hear you talk about it Great, thank you. I'm a fan of your work. <laughs> I'm very excited. You showed up. What were you thinking when you? I mean, I talked about your piece, but I've never talked to you about your piece. So I'm really curious to, for your take on that in this context. Um, yeah, I think that what you said about it is, you know, exactly what I was thinking. Um, I made that really like shortly after I moved to the Hudson Valley. And I lived in Brooklyn before that. And um, I'd never lived up here. And so it was, you know, as, as you said, I usually work in the studio, but I was like traveling around and exploring and, and seeing all of these like semi tractor trailers with huge food advertisements that would you know that that would contrast with the landscape and you know I have a number of them one of like you know um Fryhofer's cookies sort of like like this and then the mountains behind them and kind of like a, a similar rhythm and you know, beyond, you know, that relationship of like food, how is that food made? Here is the landscape it's come out of. It was also um, a sort of re reversal yeah. of scale um, and a lot to do with advertising in our world. And um, yes, but I'm so happy that um, that is in the collection at the Dorsky. Um, is the show, it, the show is still up, correct? It's up, yeah, it's up until July the 11th. Oh, okay, so I'll have to come in. Oh, um, awesome. <laughs> I'm just, you know, like, <laughs> I'm 15 miles away, so <laughs> I will have to come in. Let uh, me know when you come if you fancy meeting. Okay, I love that. okay, sure. Awesome. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, I love the scale. I love the close-up greasy burger, you know, <laughs> it's so visceral. I think I wrote on the label, humor and horror combined. In this <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. It, yeah. That yeah, and I, and I like the way the, the texture of the hamburger is similar to the rock in front of it. Yeah. That little piece of vegetation and then you get the lettuce on the burger and just that kind of like <laughs> it's so good weird relationship yeah mm. yeah it was super exciting to find it like oh man this is so perfect <laughs> hi linda i see that you unmuted yourself did you have a question <laughs> linda was here earlier to yes. call the show hi linda hello um, yeah, this is the first time I've been to the gallery and kind of new to the area, but um, really loved your show. Um, it was very inspiring. Thanks. And I love the question. It was extremely thought provoking. And I think it's a very key question to kind of our, our world and our existence today, because the earth is the foundation of everything, because everything is on it buildings, people, it's, you know, it's, 
it's what our earth is made of. Yeah, and you're made of it too. <laughs> yes, and we're made of it too, exactly. It's inside so it's us. To look at the notes that a lot of people re referred to it as, you know, the dirt under their nails or in the garden, you know, yeah, that there's yeah. a certain place for it, but actually dirt is everywhere. So I loved, um, it was very helpful for your analogy of, you know, soil versus dirt, because that was a beautiful thing. And, um, and it really is soil and all of our technologies and things that we have created and technology and uh, just industrial revolution. It came from the minerals that are in the soil, you know, the metals that create the buildings and the bridges and, and the cars and so forth. Everything comes from the soil and yeah, and the health of it and the richness of it. So um, I really love that. So I thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, there's so much to think about. I mean, kind of it spreads out into being about everything. <laughs> so it was really hard to keep it focused and a little bit concentrated, but keep it open enough that people can jump with it wherever. And it's been really fascinating to see the different associations people have made. Some people are like, you know, I feel like dirt or um, my mother treated me like dirt or dirt is gossip that we spread and we should, yes. but we do, but we love it. Yeah, the <laughs> Um, and a lot of people are like, yeah, I love dirt. I have this great relationship with dirt. Oh, it's a negative word. Um, what's up with that? And some, and some people are like, Lysol, dirt on my shoes. I hate sweeping, you know. Yeah. It's a very confusing word. And I think it's, it's an interesting key into this whole problem of like, why do we have this absurdly disconnected relationship? From and it started like from hundreds of years ago. I mean, it's been a long time that people have, created that bad connotation around yeah dirt. and I think it you know it, it comes with with the colonization of, of America or you know what is now known as you know ah. America <clears throat> so it really comes with that culture that that idea of ownership of separation of domination of like superiority and difference otherness and and that language too it's, it's all connected it's all so I don't know if maybe it's maybe this is like a call to come up with a new word <laughs> I don't know what it would be. We have some good words around um, that that demands respect of it. Yeah, that just acknowledges equalness. You know, yeah, a balance. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And what's interesting is this happens to be a time where my daughter, who's twenty three, going cross country, you know, young, exploring the world, went to Mount Rushmore. She said, "I don't want to go there because it was um, the Native Americans' um, sacred rock," and the way we dominated it was we not only took it, but we carved into it. I know. <laughs> altered, altered their sacred rock to yeah. show it's like total abuse. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. And so you're right. It's yeah. I, I love the thinking that you're you're sharing and that it did come from the civilization of Europeans coming and dominating and controlling. And we've controlled it to the point that we don't even understand it or notice it. Well, that's exactly right. And I think one of the one of the things I'm really interested in right now is the way we can seamlessly go between going for a hike at Minnewaska, you know, and having this beautiful view and feeling like we're communing with nature, and then going to the supermarket and buying really toxic produce that's destroying the land and it's right. destroying us. You know, there's, there's no seamless. There's no, <laughs> but we can go there and eat something in that landscape that's really toxic and is, is destroying the land. And and then we can go to the supermarket and not think about you know whether whether the food that like I like to buy organic apples because I know that they're healthier. And like apples mm -hmm. are one of the big absorbers of pesticides. Oh yeah, I get I get to do that even though they're more expensive because I'm privileged. So the, like that's not okay either. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. not even like the farmers who are growing things like industrially farmed potatoes. You know, that, for example, you know, it's, it's wonderful book, I mean, The Botany of Desire talks about the potato. It talks about this particular type of potato um, that McDonald's uses. And it's, it's used by McDonald's because it's the only type of potato that, that can make a long enough fry to stick out of the red box high enough to look awesome. Oh. Um, and so because there's such a huge buyer there are massive swathes of America being farmed with this one particular type of potato, the russet Burbank. Um, and you can't farm potatoes that way because they just get blight and die. 
And so they have to spray them with stuff like about 12 different times during their lifetime and after they've been dug up. Um, and they're so toxic, the farmers won't eat them and they don't even make any money off it. It's just like this crazy commercialized mm -hmm. cycle of doom. <laughs> right. but, um, it's not cheaper to farm that way. And the, and the earth is being so ravaged in the process that it's hardly fertile at all anymore. It's not sustainable. It, can't, it actually can't be done more for much longer. Right. Um, as well as being harmful to pollinators because you know if it's a monocultural crop maybe the potatoes flower for two weeks out of the year and then there's nothing to eat for those pollinators so it's problematic in so many ways and it's yeah. not profitable but the, a lot of the farmers apparently are getting that information from from the pesticide companies so it's like this you know it's like this kind of crazy lobbying cycle that we see quite a lot in this country <laughs> right yeah i worked for um connecticut nofa northeast organic farming association so i promoted <laughs> Although all those kinds of teachings and also work for the conservation district, which is, here's the interesting twist is that we use the soil to uh, filter out the chemicals in the soil <laughs> and that the soil itself cleanses <laughs> itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And oh. it filters it through, you know, sand and gravel and different, you know, sizes of the earth to help filter it but uh it's yeah. interesting that it can even heal itself mm. which is like the human body too is that our bodies become toxic from not eating organic and and that our bodies can heal themselves but they all need help and so your exhibit is really a cry to help the earth and acknowledge that it exists so thank you it's just beautiful i just love everything Oh, I lost you, Linda. We might have lost Linda. Um, oh, it's beef. Well. Um, that was that was so fabulous. <laughs> and it, often, often it's not, you know, often it's not our bodies healing themselves. They do a lot of that, but often it's those microorganisms. <laughs> the good, the other ones that yeah. are helping, helping us to survive in and, all the ways and, and to fight. Really, I, I wanted to share with you, I got stuck at the very beginning of your talk when uh -huh. you said that when you came here and find out that people were calling dirt to the earth, because I, I share that same, uh, I don't know if to say it, trauma, but like shock. I, I was like, well, yeah, if you touch it somehow, your hands get dirt, but why you call dirt to that, you know? I'm still thinking, uh, well, well, it's not that I thought about that as much as you were thinking, obviously, but, but it really impacted me also when you change a diaper because it's soiled. And I was like, how could it be soiled? That it was not even touching the ground, you know? Because obviously, as you can tell, English is not my first language. So on top of all the cultural thing and, and, and the language interpretation, I, I found myself trapped way too often in those questions with myself, you know, trying to make sense of where that came from. And uh, I, I love the explanation that you gave us uh, because it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, and I thought that those two tables at the doors with dirt on it were your piece. You know, I didn't see the identification and I was like, Emily, yeah, she wrote. <laughs> she wrote I mean, I had the same reaction when I found it. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Peter. But then I have a question that is more a technical question, maybe for you, Zach. How did Dorsky keep that piece in particular? <laughs> yeah, it is propri proprietary dirt. We have it in, I think it's in a they're in coffee cans. Uh, Amy Fredrickson, who's here, might know. Oh, you, interesting. You get that piece out. Oh, you're muted. Um, you were asking about, uh, it was stored in paint cans. Oh, paint cans. Paint cans, yeah. And so it's like, it's the original dirt from when he was in um, the Hudson Valley Artist Show. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, too. So you collect it up and, and collect it, yeah. 
Yeah, oh, okay. He has like specific instructions for how you have to um lay it out too. Like you can't just pour it on. You have to to um like sprinkle it on um a little bit at a time. Um, so it took a while, but it was fun. Yeah. Well, that was going to be my second question, but you already answered. Thank you for that. <laughs> And um, he also left instructions for if you have to refill it, if we ever need to get more dirt, um, the dirt has to be from a 30 mile radius of the museum. So it has to always be 100% Hudson Valley. Yeah, yeah, good. Great. Maria Elena, I have a question for you. Sure, sure. Is Spanish your first language? Yes. What is the word in Spanish for dirt or earth or whatever? Tierra, like earth. Yeah. And it was this, it's the same, that's what you would use. It's like, it's it's always, yeah, it's always tierra. Even if you get it in bags for your pot inside of the house, that's tierra. Uh, yeah. If you walk, uh, you know, barefoot on the yard, you're walking on tierra. I mean, and the planet is the planet tierra. So yeah, I, we, we keep, we keep that connotation, you know, yeah. but if, if it happened that it sticks to yourself or to your clothes, then your clothes are dirty. But but you know because you're the, with tierra, so but but we don't call it differently. No matter what it is, it's tierra. So when it's when you're dirty, what's the word for that? Well, when you are dirty, you're sucia. Sucia. It depends on the gender, you know, <laughs> but yeah, uh, sometimes we use like, uh, um, because tierra can become a verb and you get enterrado. So you can be enterrado if you were buried. Okay. Right, underground. Buried. Yeah. Or you are enterrada if you have Tierra over your body, but you're still alive. So you are not buried <laughs> under. <laughs> no. So it, yeah, it is interesting because, you know, then it becomes a little bit complex, but it's always, always uh, Tierra. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, that's where we get the word interred. I bet it is. Mm. Interred? <laughs> Like enterrado? <laughs> yeah, there's interred. I think that means buried, right? It's like when, yeah, you're, when you're dead and buried, interred. Mm -hmm. Put in the ground. Yeah. Emily, I just think I, I'm Emily's mother. <laughs> Mom. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Can I find? Where's a video here? Yeah, then I can say. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, I just find, I hope you have a lot of time. I hope, I hope you're not going to be in the dirt anytime soon because I think you've opened a can of worms in that earth and you have a lot a lot of other things to do now because I think it is I, I think it's fascinating but it is never ending it is everything we do has to do with earth with where we come from where where we go to where whether we are uh, 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 cremated or buried, we, we will all end up in the earth somewhere, or under the sea maybe, but still, it's all the earth, and it is, it is as, as the tierra in, in, in Spanish, it is, it is also planet earth, so it is, it's so wholesome, it's beautiful, and I think you should, you should do a lot of te teaching about this, or, 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 or talking about it, or, or taking it much further, because this is only, you just opened the lid. I think that's, that's right. right. Yeah, that's, that's I really, right. I mean, really enjoyed it. And now I will keep my mouth shut because I shouldn't no, really be. Keep your mouth shut. Um, thanks for saying that. Because I think the two things really resonate with me from that. One is this feels like the very beginning of something that needs to keep growing and getting bigger. And is, a, is part of a wider dialogue. It's not like it's something I thought of all by myself, but it's, it's a personal response to this problem. Um, <clears throat> I do think it's a problem. And I think it's just the beginning of something. And um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, yeah, uh, the workshops feel like a, a really part of my practice now. I mean, I think that's such an important thing to do and such an interesting way to interact. It doesn't feel didactic. It's like, let's ask these questions together and see what happens, simply see what happens. Um, that feels like work 
in a good way, you know. Yes. <laughs> that feels like part of it, part of the show, part of the artwork, and part of the kind of life, you know, reason for reason for being a way to be useful, you know. It really reminded me of, of education being the, the key word here. You need to to engage everybody. And I think so. I'm very proud of you that you actually had some school kids, didn't you? Didn't you have some some high school kids or something? Well, keep doing that because I think it's it could go very far. I mean, this is this is so necessary for all of us to know this and to know we, we do know it in a way when it's pointed out to us, but we don't think about it. And I think with the younger think, generation, you know, if you if you make people aware of the fact that that is a choice and that there are unfair things going on, but also you get to make personal choices. Right from an early age, I think that's that's really significant <laughs> because at some point yes. people get a little more stuck in their ways later on in life. Uh, not always, but seems to be the case. But I think it's not something that really appears in the education system that much at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that's absent. You know, there are plenty of amazing teachers trying to deal with this stuff, but interviewing teachers has been really interesting in terms of people's relationships with land and bugs and a lot of people being frightened to go outside um, or to eat something that's been grown in the school garden but they would eat the same thing if it came from the grocery store because it comes because it's actually in, in a tin yeah in a can yeah. yeah or not necessarily but but just to the process of going to the supermarket and buying something is now how we normally accept or like that's how we get our food and we don't have this connection anymore to how it's grown or where it comes from and so even if you know rationally that this, I don't know, you know, this zucchini was grown right here in, in earth that we monitor and it's quite safe. And this zucchini, the grocery store comes from who knows where and in grown in who knows what way, people generally are much more willing to accept the grocery store and simply because it becomes so normalized that that's how we receive food. And that's problematic. So I think that's another area I really want to mess around in is like <laughs> disrupt the grocery store. <laughs> Get in there and just ask questions there. It's a really interesting place to meet a whole range of people. And there's a lot of hidden practices going on, which, which mm -hmm. we just don't question. And that's really problematic. I think. Here in Britain, uh, I live in England. Uh, here in Britain, uh, I think people have, not everybody, but a lot of people have Come, have become a bit, bit closer to the earth because of the pandemic and of being stuck at home. And the only thing you can do is to go for a walk. So yeah. the people have gone for a walk massively. And uh, we have more paths now and more cycle paths and more forests are opening and so on. And so, so maybe this helps, do you think? We have to go back to basics. Yeah, so I think that's, it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't, maybe that's true depending on where you live. Maybe that's true if you have a place where you can go and spend time outside. Um, yeah. People living in cities during the pandemic have been stuck in their apartments for a long time. Or, you know, or don't have access to safe earth to mess around in or to go nice places to go for walks. Um, you know, I think it, the pandemic has been such a divider in terms of privilege. You know, the, the privileged have enjoyed those things more than ever. And, you know, in, if we're talking privilege in terms of access to clean land, um, and of course there's so many ways to talk about it, but that's, a, I think that's been a really huge, it's been an eye opener for me anyway, to see how people have been impacted by, by that isolation in different situations. I grew up in a suburb in Texas and I spent a lot of time outside. And one of the places we loved to go was what we called the Creek. Uh -huh. <laughs> I went back a few years after I'd left Texas and the creek is all paved over. It's a sewage, it's sewage run, runoff. <laughs> well, it's sewage runoff at the time? Yeah. Oh man, yeah. There's no creek in Mesquite, Texas. No, it's, <laughs> so by, you know, and so and then having grown up in a suburb, I had like the relationship to nature in some ways was, I was outside a lot, there were a lot of trees, uh, you know, um, but then living in a city and then finally moving up to the Hudson Valley, which is this, this magnificently beautiful um, um, uh, uh, landscape, you know, um, I've learned time differently. It's been very healthy for me. I've learned dirt very differently. 
Um, and so, uh, I don't know. But yeah, that sometimes what you think is nature isn't even <laughs> like um, the potatoes. <laughs> the potatoes, right. And also like, you know, one of the areas I'm kind of interested in studying a bit, which I'm messing around with, with the show Owning Earth um, at Unison Arts Center is um, recreational areas of forest. So it's like places that we go to get away from our urban lives or, uh, you know, refresh ourselves or get some fresh air. We have very specific expectations of what that should look like and it's quite carefully curated and it's really nothing like being in the deep woods. Um, <laughs> and so I kind of, I think that's a, a, an interesting sort of ambiguous place too, is like, well, well, what's acceptable for us in terms of spending time outside? What do we, what do we, it still has to be amenable, you know? <laughs> how, how much do we really expose ourselves? Um, and what does that, you know, I don't know, keep, you know, at, at this point around here, everything is, there is no pure, wild, unspoiled thing. There's, there's so much pollution in the air. Um, there's microplastics in the air and toxins. And so there's, and there's suburban hedges sprouting up in forests because they've, you know, they've just seeded themselves on the wind. And, and so <laughs> you go quite deep into the woods and you're still finding invasive plants and, and there is, there's no such thing around here anymore as like pure um, unspoiled land. And so it's always on this sliding scale now. I think that's kind of a strange, <laughs> strange world we've made. Well, I want to be thoughtful of Emily's time. If there, um, if anybody else has a question, we maybe one more, but otherwise, thank you all so much. Thank you, Emily, for your incredible exhibition, your incredible projects, and in your wonderful uh, presentation. Um, every time you talk about the show, I learn something new. Uh, so, you know, this has just been a great experience for the museum working with you and. I hope the relationship doesn't end at the end of your residency. So, any other Me questions? Too. It's been or? such a pleasure and um, not quite over yet. <laughs> um, awesome. Thanks so much for attending. It's great. I've just, every time I have a fresh group of people to have this conversation with new things come up and it's just, it's really amazing learning experience for me. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Is this Thank you. Thank you. Is this going to be on YouTube or something? Yes, it will be on the Dorsky Museum YouTube page um, and on our website and probably also on the uh, exhibition page. There'll be, it'll be linked. Okay, great, because I'm going to ask a few people to watch it. Of course, you have to. And give yes, comments. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I've been, I, I won't be able to come before it closes, I think, in the beginning of July. But uh, well, you have an inside line, so it's okay. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. I'll come and, and, and pester you about it. No, no, I want to know. And I will come to the Dorsky Museum, uh, uh, but I don't know when, because that depends on when we can travel again. Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Okay, it was very lovely to see everybody. And now I will disappear because I'm not really supposed to be here. There you are. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, everyone. Everybody have a great day. Get out there and dig in the dirt. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks so much, Zach. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Dag, Emily.